What do you think um, the film gets right, uh, gets wrong? And then we can go into like what it leaves out, but it isn't necessarily incorrect about. So what, what, do you, what do you credit it for getting right? And then getting, and then what do you judge it for getting wrong? It, it's hard to, to like, what does it get right? It gets a lot of things right. It, it actually surprised me because I went in with extremely low expectations. Because my feeling, and I wonder if David felt similarly, when I heard that Nolan was making an Oppenheimer biopic, I thought, oh, it's going to be really bad. Because like the appeal of Oppenheimer to a filmmaker is usually really superficial. And in most films that feature an Oppenheimer as a character, I'm not impressed because they love to make him a relatable everyman or they make him a, you know, a, a friend of all. And like this is not the guy, right? Like He is a much more complicated figure than that. And even with the Cold War downfall stuff, it's usually about like poor Oppenheimer, just the victim of his times or something. And it's he's he's more complicated than that. And 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 even he often gets cast as this kind of like dove and he's not a dove. Right. At all. And so I was going in thinking he's going to be so tempted by those existing narratives and I was really surprised because like that isn't really the story he's trying to tell. I'm not sure I 100% am inside Nolan's brain about what the story he is trying to tell, but it's not that Oppenheimer. It's a different Oppenheimer and Cillian Murphy's take on him is not as uh, one dimensional as it looked in some of the trailers, which I appreciate it. So what I like about it, the, in terms of general getting right, it's an interpretation of Oppenheimer that feels plausible enough. I don't know if there is a right interpretation of Oppenheimer and like what motivates him and drives him. Uh, historians can argue about this forever and they all do, but like it's a plausible interpretation. It's not my Oppenheimer, but it's an Oppenheimer that feels real enough. And some of the issues about like Oppenheimer's problems with identity that I thought I was is subtle and he did a good job of that in terms of getting stuff wrong. Like you can go through the list of, lots of little errors, lots of big framing errors, lots of errors that you can tell they made because of like time constraints and narrative constraints. Yeah. Like it's a long list, but yeah. I don't know how much I want to hold him. I, I don't want to do the Neil deGrasse Tyson thing and be sure. like, uh -uh, the hat was a different color, right? Like right. that's not interesting. Um, <laughs> the biggest thing for me about what they got wrong. And this is again, a narrative choice for sure. They compress the period between 1945 and 1949 into basically nothing. And that's in the service of both moving the plot to the H-bomb stuff and the Soviets setting off a bomb and all that. But it's also in the service of like a narrative that's about Oppenheimer getting sidelined. And that's not the reality of it. Like 45 to 49, he's at his peak powers. His The, the guy running the AEC is not Louis Strauss. It's a different guy who they cut out of the movie, which I get it. It's fine. But the guy they cut out, David Lilienthal, he's a friend of Oppenheimer's, right? Like Oppenheimer is in a really important place in those years. And to cut those years in particular feeds a really wrong narrative about like both the role of science and, and the bomb and policy, but Oppenheimer in particular. It misses the real ascent before the crash. And so that was the biggest for me historical problem i have mm -hmm. what i liked I mean, i'm glad you asked like what we liked because it's so easy to like go right into yeah you know, what i liked i thought that on at least two big questions there's at least a nod towards some kind of complexity right so the ethical issues i think that it's really easy to think about the ethical questions about that are as concentrating solely on the question of should the bomb have been dropped or not, right? Whereas, and not that that's unimportant, but I think that he does a pretty good job showing that there are ethical questions throughout, right? From, the, from people's decisions to work on the project, to the debates about what to do with it, to the post-war arms buildup, that it's not, and that those weren't something that appear out of nowhere in August 1945 and then di disappear again. But that's part of just how science and the military are just sort of like jockeying position just like always. So I like that. Similarly, I like the fact that the 1954 security hearing doesn't come out of nowhere, 
right? It's not just, I mean, Alex, you sort of alluded to this, right? It's not just like, oh, it's McCarthyism now. And so somebody with Oppenheimer's past is um, suspect. There's certainly, that's true, but there is a much, much longer detailed history of Oppenheimer's various activities and sort of, um, you know, run-ins with security officials. And, um, you know, I think it portrays that pretty well. So and I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll stop there. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, Leslie, you wanted to focus on other questions, right? Cause I have more questions. So do you want me, do you want to answer that? Or do you want me to shift? No, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'll take, I'll take a crack at it. I'll okay, say, look, I mean, my, my big, my big line about the film is, you know, whatever you think about it and, you know, whatever nuclear historians or physicists or whatever, you know, when we're, when we're picking it apart and looking at, you know, the, the depictions, whether they're right or wrong. Oppenheimer, you know, nearly a billion dollars in the international uh, gross right now. Many million people have seen it. A lot of the issues that this movie um, have brought up are things that, you know, Alex and, and uh, David and I have been screaming into the wind about, and now everybody is talking about these nuclear issues. And so Oppenheimer, the movie has, I, in my opinion, has done a, a great service to bringing up what many people in, you know, the nuclear watchdog landscape call the forgotten existential threat. Yeah. So bravo to that. Um, you know, most of my my um, quibbles, if you want to call them that politely with the film, again, have to do more with omissions rather than, than right. depictions. And, you know, as we, we touched on, you know, earlier, you know, the, the lack of aftermath, um, you know, which we, we have other authors and filmmakers to, to rely on to show us that and hopefully more of that in the future, because a whole new generation really needs to be reminded of how ghastly the, the effects of these mega weapons are. Um, I would say, you know, this is this might be eccentric of me. Um, and maybe it's because I'm in Los Angeles, um, but I would say that I was actually really quite underwhelmed by the depiction of the bomb itself in uh, in the movie. Um, and and it, that sounds small minded of me, but I think it actually does quite a disservice because what we're trying to do is we're trying to depict the enormous history changing magnitude of, of these weapons. This was man's ability to destroy civilization. And as the movie points out, you know, rather excessively, in my opinion, um, you know, pops possibly instantaneously ignite the, the atmosphere, but then it, the actual bomb is, it, it's, it looked a bit dinky. Um, you know, and I, I have pulled, you know, several descriptions from eyewitnesses where they are talking about what it was actually like to be in the presence of that bomb. And it was a biblical experience. And I just think if there was ever, you know, a, a moment to use CGI, um, you know, this, this might have been it. We could have seen, you know, this bomb from space. They saw it in, in at least four states and two countries. And, and, and so I, I think that that, that was an, an, an odd choice that in a way undercut the um the gravity the gravity of of what had been brought forth by Oppenheimer and his team. I'm, and, I'm really really glad you said that, Leslie. Just because. And just to clarify, had, this is just I just want to clarify. This is yeah. the, the we don't see the bombing in Hiroshima. No, no, no. It's just no, no, no. I'm talking about the Trinity well, I know, detonation. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I'm not clarifying for you guys. I mean, for the <laughs> audience, for people who haven't seen this, um, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, Post explaining to any of you guys. But, <laughs> I, just uh, wanna, I just want to quickly just say I'm so glad Leslie brought up the how unimpressive Trinity was in the film because I feel like when I bring it up, it makes me sound really ghastly as like a nuke guy. Right. But when Leslie brings it up, it feels I'm like, yes, it's true. <laughs> as the, the not just guys cannot be impressed by this nuke, but it, yeah, it was it's yeah. like obviously a conventional weapon. It does not have the right sense a conventional explosive. It does not have the right sense of scale in Nolan's version of it at all. It's not inspiring. You don't want to quote poetry you know you're just like okay very disappointed but but, but just, you know alex just to pick up on what you're saying though i mean the, the reason why that's important is that you know the media aftermath of of uh hiroshima and nagasaki the u.s government you know they're downplaying the the radioactive aspects of the of the bomb and you know so what they're really doing in a lot of ways is they're they're, they're acknowledging that it's an atomic weapon and that it's new and and all powerful but they're also still casting it in conventional terms and so they're in many ways encouraging the american public to think of it as a conventional mega weapon it's you know twenty thousand tons of tnt that sort of thing and what that does is that it it undercuts again the extremity of of what this this weapon is and and, and also undercutting the fact that this is the weapon that goes on killing long after detonation and so 
in, it's it's a, it's a bit eerie and ironic to see this this recreation of the bomb today when we have all of the technical ability to make this really look like the mega weapon that it was um and and then not not use that why do you think they made that choice like i said i'm sure chris nolan in one of his gazillion interviews has talked about that decision and has been told about it if if, if he has talked about it i haven't come across it yet yeah. but if i do get you know the fortune of interviewing him soon then i yeah. would, chris, would if you're watching come on he yeah, he come on. He's, I heard him say at a at a screening that that he he's he doesn't like CGI. He makes a sort of a fetish of not using CGI. He felt like doing the authentic was better. And like I on the one hand, I hear you, but like you can't replicate the scale. And your brain is smart 100%. enough to know this. Like there's things in that explosion. This is kind of technical. We're like little bits of like spark of flaming stuff is going out and your brain is smart enough to know that like, that's too small, right? That's too big for this to be an atomic bomb, right? Like it's not moving at the right speed as an explosion. It's the wrong color. It's it, it, it feels just very fake. And here's the thing. You don't have to actually fake it by setting off explosives. Like the movie, the day after from 1983 does a perfectly, I mean, imagine if you did that, they use like liquid, they don't have CGI, they're doing some kind of liquid simulation type thing. And it looks pretty eerie and weird with like conventional compositing. Imagine if you did that today without CG, you'd think you could do better than what they did, which was set off some kind of explosive and then say, probably scale it or something, but it just doesn't feel right. You know, it's interesting. I'm thinking of this alongside the moment in the film where they, know, they don't show Hiroshima, right? As you mentioned, what they show is the scientists' reactions to seeing the images. And in a, in a way, intentionally or not, the moment of Trinity in the film is doing something similar. Because even though you see the explosion, Nolan is trying to use the reactions and the, the experience of the scientists and other staff members and their reactions to carry the emotional weight yeah. of it, right? In the same way that he's trying to do that for um, for Hiroshima. So there's that continuity there that like his interest seems to be in like the people who did it yeah. and less the effects or the scale. Right. Yeah. yeah, see, but even even that, like the reactions that he's depicting, there were more, I mean, again, from eyewitnesses who were there, they were more extreme. People were yeah. crying, That's they true. were throwing up. I mean, right. they they knew. Yeah. um you know what what they they were witnessing and um so i just it, it's again it just seemed to it, it's the climax of the yeah. entire movie and it's the birth of the nuclear age and you know so these these the decisions that are supposedly geared towards authenticity are anything but which is yeah. ironic yeah no, I agree. You know, and not to, not to sound totally snotty, but I just, you know, I went back after, you know, seeing Oppenheimer, you know, a couple of times and just to, to confirm that that the, the, the bomb had looked that way in the movie. And then I was like, hmm, where else have I recently seen a nuclear bomb in uh, Indiana Jones film? And I went back and I watched Indiana, it was a crystal skull. And, you know, Indiana Jones is in Nevada you know, in, yeah, as they were doing a test. And the Indiana Jones bomb looked more like a nuclear bomb than than, than Chris Chris Nolan's Trinity bomb. Uh, so you know that Hollywood can do it when they when they want to. And you know again, just this is from an eyewitness account. This is you know one reporter, the sole reporter who was there. He said, you know, there rose from the bowels of the earth a light not of this world. You know, it was a sunrise such as the world had never seen. A great green super sun climbing to a height of more than eight thousand feet. You ain't getting that in Nolan's film. Mm. You can't do that with a conventional explosive. And I just mm. throw this out again. Like there are like scale differences that are significant. And if you want to fake a nuclear bomb, there's ways to fake it, but you can't fake it by setting off something conventional. Like they don't, they're not going to, mm. you're not going to get the atmospheric phenomena. There's a difference in tens of thousands of tons to like a ton. It's it's just not the same thing. So the film makes a very deliberate choice to not even try to capture what happens in Hiroshima. Um, what do you guys think, uh, what do you think it's important for people to know about what happened there? And then what about, and you especially can speak to this, Leslie, but what about the things that happened to the downwinders? We, we see in the film, the only, the only thing we see in the film in terms of the, the bomb's impact on humans um 
is, you know, Oppenheimer is addressing an audience of his workers at Los Alamos, and he's having a couple of uh, uh, vivid visions of, you know, a woman's skin flicking away and, um, you know, a char, like almost like an indecipherable charred object. Um, And um, fine, that's, those are really like the lightest butterfly touches of hints of what these bombs did. And, um, you know, I had the, the gruesome privilege of documenting what the after effects were, you know, what the actual, what it was like to be on the receiving ends of Oppenheimer's deadly toys, you know, Sting calls it. Um, And it's no matter how many times and gifted people and eyewitnesses have described it, it's indescribable. Um, And, you know, so I, you know, in, in, in my book, I document uh, John Hersey was a New Yorker uh, war correspondent who went into Hiroshima a year later and interviewed, you know, scores of, of survivors about their experience of, of Hiroshima and created a, a harrowing account of, of the day and the, of the moment and the days following the bombing of Hiroshima. I mean, really, once you read it, you'll you'll never never forget the descriptions of, of, you know, these young families um, reduced to you know, the, just the most horrific state. Um, I will say that, honestly, the, 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 the testimonies that most impacted me as a researcher of Hiroshima, um, it was not Hersey's uh, survivors' accounts, but they were actually um, accounts that appeared later that were written by surviving Japanese doctors um, who either you know ha- had been in Hiroshima the day of or were imported from Tokyo or other places in the following days. And I will spare your um, your listeners and, and and audience the descriptions from from those books and those testimonies. But again, it's just it, it, knowing knowing the impact is intimately as I do, it makes the decision to avoid it entirely in Oppenheimer um, seem curious at best, um, or, you know, and also just a really uh, carelessly gross decision at worst. There's a line when, toward the end of the film, when Louis Strauss's character, um, and by the way, I felt thought Robert Downey Jr. was a great casting choice yeah. for that. Unexpected to me, but I thought it was great. Um, is sort of like finally sort of like recognizing, right? That like he's not, he's sort of, his demeanor, he, he's losing his cool finally a bit. And he is starting to rail against Oppenheimer a bit. Um, and he says, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's something to the effect of Oppenheimer wants credit for Trinity, the scientific right. achievement, but not blame for Hiroshima. Yeah. Right. And, I hadn't quite thought of this until you were talking, Leslie, but it seems that that's also the story Nolan wants to tell, right? You know, he wants to tell the Oppenheimer Mm -hmm. story, not really the atomic bomb story, right? And obviously those are deeply connected and overlapping, but they're not exactly the same thing, right? You know, and I think the loyalty is to the Oppenheimer story and that either allows him or nudges him away from, for better, I'm not saying this is a good thing necessarily, right? Away from some of the issues that you're bringing up. I mean, he's yeah. very clear that like, it's it's all from Oppenheimer's point of view, unless it's from essentially Strauss's, which is all right. in black and white. Right. Apparently, I haven't seen it yet. My copy's in the mail, but apparently he wrote the script from the entirely the first person. Yeah. Like, like it's, which is really a weird, right? But like that show, and I agree that like there's there's real ups and downs to doing it that way, right? There's a lot that's missed. Anything that is not an Oppenheimer's line of sight is not in the film, which is includes Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Downwinders, uh, you know, uh, uh, the rest of the Manhattan Project, yeah. right? Like, like it it narrows the vision, and I can see the argument for that as art. I can also see the real like, hey, you're kind of you're missing out on a lot when you do that. In the many interviews that I've done in the af- you know in the aftermath of the film's release, you, you one acknowledges this is a biopic, and mm-hmm. as we all know, with any with any book, with any film, any any creative project, you have to narrow the prism. No book can tell can tell everything. But uh, your vicious the- editor told you, Leslie, as I've heard you say in interviews, <laughs> <laughs> my wicked and cruel editor. Yeah, so maybe basically cut half of my book out. Um, but it, it, it's the problem is is that you know just because you know you're narrowing to Oppenheimer's point of view, the fact his his 
weapon created enormous pain for you know many tens of thousands of people and, 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 and agonizing death and you can't extricate them. You just can't. And, and so just like, you know, it, it, they, those issues were certainly not just in Oppenheimer's peripheral vision. This was like, he changed the world. I mean, Chris Nolan's big line about Oppenheimer is he's the most important man who ever lived. And there's the asterisk that says, I'm the second most important to bringing him to everybody's <laughs> attention again, right? But, um, you know, but I, it just, the, those, those issues, they, they just, they can't, they can't be extricated. I mean, the, the sanitizing, the, the compartmentalization is really, I hate this word, but I'm going to use it. Problematic. Yeah. I knew, I knew that was going to, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you knew it was coming. You saw no, it. No, but right? it has, it has to be.